Welcome to episode 10 of The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. Just like always, you're with Ian and Mike. And we're here together talking about HMS Surprise, the third book in the Aubrey Maturin canon. And we're two episodes in, Mike. Could you give us a quick recap of where we got to last time in our reading of HMS Surprise? Sure, Ian. Last time, as we started, the surprise was pulling out of Rio. We'd left lethargy, the sloth behind with the Irish Franciscans to sip the altar (laughs) wine there. And we were headed across the Southern Ocean. And I think a great part of our, our session last time was spent with the incredible storms in those lower latitudes with a a little bit of an eye on the albatrosses and perhaps a throwback to the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And then some action that took part over days as people were worried about whether they would survive these storms or not, including the seamen having their way with the landsmen, uh, talking about all the horrible things that could happen, like running violently into Australia. Luckily, As we started that journey along with Tom Horn, he took some time to appear as a guest on the show from the mapping project. We got to follow the surprise journey on the map, and we ran very comfortably into Australia for that interview. (laughs) We sure did. (laughs) And then after the storm, what happened next? Surprise took a turn left, right, and went up the Indian Ocean. Yeah, exactly. They were heading up the Indian Ocean um, coming in towards Bombay, and we now have this culmination of Stephen waiting to see Diana in Bombay. And we were a little concerned as as they're pulling into Bombay that there might have been some foreshadowing as Stephen, sitting in the back of the uh, ship, plucks a sea serpent out of the ocean. And uh, Pullings reminds him how deadly poison those she sea serpents can be. (laughs) I like what you did there. Very good. Very good. And on arrival, Stephen's explored Bombay. He's enjoyed the sights and the sounds and the smells and the culture and the philosophy of being in India and in Bombay. And as the festival goes by, he finds himself face to face with Diana. Yeah. Well, I, I think we could say this every week, some of the most fabulous writing, but this one, I've seen so many of the folks posting online talking about how this part of HMS Surprise may be some of their best writing in the canon, or at least some that people get drawn to so emotionally. And it's it's amazing how you've got, as we get into Bombay, and Stephen has that time to exploit Bombay, you, you talked about his journal entry last week, that yeah. on the one hand, you've got this incredible diversity in the city, diversity of people from all over the world, of all different faiths. Uh, so many people accommodating, so many folks who look and act so differently. On the other hand, you know, we've got sort of remnants of colonialism, or the, the right, there was no remnants yeah. at that point. We've got class, we've got race, we've got Stephen, this great egalitarian who is traversing all of this um, and noting, you know, kind of the petty jealousy, how sex between face disagree over the littlest details like a date, how how the different classes and even people within classes have this really deadly gossip, how people are going to sort of even look at uh, duels and deaths so differently. Some people who are you know, duels of honor, others it's put off to it's the hot weather and this ridiculous killing for no reason to one of Diana's companions sort of complaining about how with the uh, drought that now there's going to be all these thousands, perhaps tens and hundreds of thousands of people dying. And it you know, will make travel just so awful to have to ride past all that. And, you know, a real diversity of writing and commentary and pictures yeah. and thoughts and sounds and smells from Patrick O'Brien in this incredible city. And juxtapositions as well, as you've said, of color and magic and maybe even tranquility and excitement alongside this idea that life is cheap and that death is just around the corner everywhere you go. Yeah, yeah, great point again. And we've got so many foreshadowings or, you know, with all this wonderfulness, there is all this death throughout uh, leading up as they're coming into Bombay and even in Stephen's wonderful early weeks in Bombay. That's right, that's right. Now, speaking of foreshadowing, maybe we can try something here. 
I want to jump ahead to the end of the chapters that we're going to be talking about in the book this week, because I think that the closing words of this section feature a quote from a poem by Dryden. And I think I think that that quote gives us some kind of an idea of where we're headed. I'm going to read out the quote, and I'm also going to give our big spoiler alert for this episode. Oh, yes. So the poem is a quotation from a dramatic poem called The Secular Mask by Dryden, written in the 18th century. And the four lines that are going to be spoken by Stephen are as follows. All of a piece throughout. Thy chase had a beast in view. Thy wars brought nothing about. Thy lovers were all untrue. So we've got something about pursuit and the chase. We've got something about war and kind of preparations and resources for war. And we've got something about love. And this sounds like it might all have a bit of a dismal ending from the tone of those four lines. So this is a good moment for us to say, if you're only partway through HMS Surprise and you haven't got to the end of chapter seven, at least get to the end of chapter seven before you continue with listening to this episode because there's a story arc with it carries with it a big spoiler that we might not want to upset for you for sure so let's go back to the world of Stephen in bombay and as you say mike he's been exploring the streets and he's been getting to know the culture and reflecting a little bit on all that diversity and all those juxtapositions that he sees around him and we encounter this really great memorable character one of the highlights, I think, of all the secondary characters that we come across in Jack and Stephen's travels, this young girl, Dill, is one of the most memorable and one that, that readers seem to hold close to their hearts. So she's a little girl. We don't really know how old she is, except that Stephen writes that she's at that age of just verging on adulthood. And she takes Stephen under her wing. And this, this symbolism of wings might turn out to be important. And he sees her as representing this life that he was talking about that you referred to before, Mike, this idea of a combined, both both spiritual and colorful and magical, but also very earthly life. Right. And remember, he's he's arrived there right at a fairly low ebb, but and with a huge amount of tension inside him. He's really hoping that he's going to meet Diana. He suspects or hopes or fears that this might be the moment for him to put one more time his case to Diana that they could be together. And Dill has this very pure, virginal, uncomplicated, childlike, down-to-earth view of the world, not weighed down by her own gender her, or her own sex, not weighed down by the position that she has in the caste system. And she's this street-smart character who knows a bit of all of the languages and cultures in Bombay, knows a little bit about all of the religions that are represented, and guides Stephen in the early days of him finding his way around Bombay. Right. And she's so exuberant. She's a little girl. She also mothers Stephen. Yeah. Um, her spirit, her sense of independence are doing exactly what she wants to do. You know, and, and Stephen thinks at some point uh, that, that Dill really brings Diana to mind for him. Yeah, that's right. That independence and character and sort of dab you all, I don't care what you think. Exactly. Attitude. Right. And and she's got she's got no boundaries at all in telling him what to do and telling him what a what an uncultured and and bizarre person he is. There's that great section, Mike, where she's almost teaching him how to eat eat food Bombay style. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, they're they've gone to watch this Hindu ceremony and they're all gathered along with thousands and thousands of people and and Dill's brought some food along. Um and uh, so Dill slips her hand into Stevens and looks at him and says to Stephen, art very strangely clothed, Stephen. I almost took thee for a tapiwala. I have a whole leaf of pandu. Come and eat it before it spills. Mind thy good bizarre shirt in the dung. It's far too long, thy shirt. <laughs> and she you know, leads him across the way there, finds a space to sit down and looks at him and and realizes that, you know, Stephen sometimes just doesn't know how to comport himself quite so much. And she says, lean thy head forward, she said, unfolding the leaf and setting the turgid mess between them. Nay, 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 forward, more forward. Dost not see thy shirt all slobbered? Oh, for shame, where wast thou brought up? 
what mother bore thee forward? <laughs> and she uh, she goes on and on with Stephen to the point of actually going over, licking his shirt clean, and then sitting down in front of them and feeding Stephen herself. And, and you have this little dialogue back and forth, not so much a dialogue as a monologue of, you know, Open thy mouth, and with an expert hand she molded the pondu into little balls and fed him. Close thy mouth, Stephen. Swallow. Open. There, Maharaj. <laughs> Another. There, my garden of nightingales. Open, close. You can kind of hear the, you know, the mom trying to feed the little baby yeah. a little bit here. And uh, and then we have a little throwback here to uh, to post captain. She says, "Thou canst not eat much better than a bear." <laughs> Swallow, pause now and belch. Dost not know how to belch? Thus, I can belch whenever I choose. Belch twice. <laughs> so, I I just love the interaction between these two, and the fact that he takes it. He's in in a in a state, and she is of a persona that means. This is fine, and it's it's warm and welcomed and and helpful to him. Contrast that with one or two episodes ago when the, he was in oh. London and convalescing and being cared for, and he was having none of it. He could not take the the tiniest sliver of any amount of anybody else's solicitude or help or instructions or anything remotely like mothering. But here, he's really warming to Dill, and she's really taking him on in this way. It's really touching. It's lovely. Absolutely. She's teaching him the language. She's taking him around to see things. She's, you know, it really is, as you point out, Ian, it's a very different kind of relationship for Stephen. And it seems to be helping. We're not being told this, I think, because Stephen resists it or that he's seeing anything behind it. He's just able to kind of relax into this relationship where somebody else is affectionate, somebody else shows him love. And that's fine. And I think O'Brien is saying something important to us about his perspective on the relationship between adults and children. And this kind of uncomplicated love is really, really something he wants us to pay attention to. Yeah. And yeah. The, 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 the adult love and the uncomplicated child love come together when Dill and Stephen and Diana encounter each other. And all of a sudden the penny drops for Dill and she realizes what's going on because she's pretty smart to the ways of relationships between adults. Um, I like this quote. Stephen felt the weight of Dill's unwinking scrutiny. Oh, oh, she said, I understand at last. Oh, Krishna, oh, Stephen Bahadur Sivaji, melter of hearts. Ha, 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 dost thou understand? She is wooing thee. And she thinks, A, thinks it's hilarious to see Stephen, this bizarre, bear-like, strange, ill-mannered person having such a beautiful woman as, a, as the object of his attention. And she says, ah, these people are fools. It's written on their foreheads. They are rich. Thou art poor. They are young and thou art ancient. They are handsome. And, well, most holy men are hideous, but more or less innocent. It's very, very lovely. And she goes on to have this really touching connection with Diana. Now, Mike, I I don't think Diana comes comes out of anybody's point of view with very much credit or very much redemption in this book. This is this is a book where Diana shows the, the really cruel, destructive side of of her character and where she is in her life. But when Dill and Diana meet each other, there's this really touching interaction, and we we have this really sweet conversation where, although Diana does all of the bad things that we suspect her of. She's also being genuinely nice to Stephen and she's really open and frank in being pleased to see him and affectionate towards him. And second of all, she's charming to Dill. I think she she earns a little bit back from us for her character by being so charming and so so woman to woman in this conversation with Dill. Again, we get the idea of scent coming up, this uh, handkerchief scented with attar. And she gives the handkerchief to Dill and gives it to her in respectful language and compliments Dill on her beauty and says, this handkerchief is for you. And Dill is really enchanted by this. Right. So for well, a moment, just for a brief moment, we've got Stephen and the, the, the new affection-bearing character Dill and the prospectively love-bearing character of Diana, all three of them having conversation together. And it's a beautiful and light and colorful moment. Makes you wonder what might be going to happen next. <laughs> true. You know, and we've gone from... You know, Stephen and Dill being together to Stephen glancing way up in the air, following these vultures 
to dropping his glance back down and finding that he finds himself staring in the eyes of Diana, who he didn't expect to see in this crowd because he didn't expect her to be there for a few days to, as you say, this great interaction where Dill at first is like, Stephen, tell this lady to quit stepping on my robe. And then Diana just wins Dill over and Dill can't quite help herself. So it, it really is quite something. It really is. And and for Diana, this is a nice contrast. We we hear from Diana that she's not having the greatest time, although she's there with Canning and she's very attached to Canning. Her reputation is clearly one of being rather a loose woman and her personal history is known about and the, the irregularity of her connection with Canning is known about. And she complains pretty bitterly about how blown upon by the gossip of these other females she is and how little regard she has for all the other people who are gossiping about her. Right. But spending quite a lot of her time with, with Canning away, trying to live in European Bombay or British Bombay society, she's clearly not having the greatest time. No, no, no. As you say, kind of merciless gossip. And uh, you know, the people who perhaps will take her in are, are the ones who are really afraid of offending Canning. You know, she's Canning's mistress at this point, essentially. But we've got Diana there at the end of that conversation. She's she's seen Stephen. She's left three military officers that she's come to watch the ceremony with, and and she it's time to go back. Their their little horse drawn cart was stuck in the uh, in the procession there, and and she has to run back. But she says, Stephen, you've got to come see me. And uh, she realizes, or she thinks that Stephen would never be able to find her. So she asks Dill to bring him by night yeah. and and that's what led to your your fabulous passage there of you know she's wooing these Stephen you know she needs another child those three husbands won't do so I love the way that her Dill's sort of assessment of Stephen relative to these three other husbands or officers that Dill saw with <laughs> sounds a lot like <laughs> Stephen's assessment to Jack about how Jack stacks up against Sophie's other potential suitors back in England, oh, which we had just left true, not too long earlier. <laughs> you know, Jack, you're no Adonis. Stephen, you're kind of a hideous uh, holy man there. <laughs> yeah, no oil painting. No oil painting there, friend. That's right, for sure. Now, as... Stephen thinks that his ship quite literally might be in, that he might have the chance to make his case to Diana and that there might be the chance to rebuild a relationship. He makes this great gesture of generosity. He's kind of recruiting Dill to act as his messenger a little bit and asking her to give some guidance and help him around the city. And he knows that the thing that her heart most desires is this set of bangles. She really covets jewellery and he decides... The, the gift that he's going to give her are these three bangles. Stephen promised to grant Dill three bangles. And as he hands over this gift of these three items of jewellery, O'Brien writes, it's as though she too had been warned in a dream. Dill stopped breathing and watched with motionless intensity. Here is the first wish, he said, taking out one bangle and the second and the third. She reached forward a hesitant hand and touched them lightly. She held one for a moment and put it solemnly down, staring at her arm and the gleaming band of silver. The rapture of possession seized her. She burst into wild laughter, slipped them all off and on, gave them a name. She leapt up and spun, jerking her thin arms to make the bracelets clink. Earnest, loving thanks, broken down by exclamations. How had he known? Wisdom nothing to him, of course. Such a blaze of light. Might she have the cloth that they were wrapped in? And... O'Brien really delights in writing nicely to us when characters are overcome by joy. We had that uh, a little while ago when Pullings was promoted, and we've got it again here right. when Dill receives this gift of bangles from Stephen. It's so, so touching and so warm and joyful. Again, we get deeply into the there's a there's, there's very, very poignant relationship between Stephen and Dill. And since we're post our spoiler warning, I guess everybody who's listening now knows that there's going to be a sad turn to the story of Dill. And there must have been something that O'Brien wanted to talk about in the connection between adults and children. And he very, very poignantly, empathetically describes the the unbridled joy of of the life of a child. When Dill runs away to give his message to the ship, O'Brien has this joy and innocence. The image of Dill, silver bangles on display, skipping down the hill. She vanished in the twilight, her gleaming arms held out like wings, and the letter grasped in her mouth. And 
for me, that's written by somebody who's seen a child running away to do an errand with joy. And I'm going to venture a little bit into the world of what might have been going on in O'Brien and his life to say that like, I think amongst amongst all of the unclarity about O'Brien's life and his family connections, he didn't have the most successful and most loving connection with his parents, particularly with his father. His son and his stepson clearly both... Uh, I, I, either on occasion or all the way through had difficulty making a connection with him and yet we have this really warm kind of glowing testimony about the love between an adult and a child and oh, i don't know what to say apart from it makes you think well and, and written is only o'brien ken here is Stephen, and we've said perhaps absent a little bit of this real closeness except maybe to some degree with jack and what does Stephen love? What does Stephen get excited about? When does all of a sudden the dialogue get completely interrupted and Stephen goes off? Well, it's a bird. And, you know, we remember back to Master and Commander in their early conversation. You know, here's this bird or that bird or something in nature. And here is Dill. And she looks like a bird. And that, you know, yeah. for Stephen, yeah. this is it. You know, Dill receiving those gifts so graciously, being so completely... Uh, taken by them, you know, if only Diana had the same reaction to some of Stephen's gifts, we'd have a completely different series. <laughs> oh, if only, if only. I think this might be a good moment for us to take a break. Oh, good idea. So we have to find out some more about what's going on as Stephen travels across the city in the evening time to meet Diana. We have to find out more about what happens as Dill's message arrives at the ship. We have to see if this story is going to take a turn in one direction or another. So we'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back. You're with Ian and Mike, and we're partway through reading HMS Surprise in The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. So, Mike, what kind of a scene does Stephen encounter when he gets to the house that Diana's living in? Shared, I think, with Canning, although he's away, and shared with his companion, Lady Forbes. Yeah, Lady Forbes. I mean, initially, Stephen walks in. And and there's this stair, and on the stairs is a scorpion hiding, which Stephen sees and points out to the ladies. And so, uh, again, it's this little O'Brien thing with a little bit in the background. Ah, a scorpion, first thing. Sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, my, my old Twilight Zone. But the... Um, but this and this lady Forbes, a little bit like some characters that we've seen earlier in the canon here. She's, you know, she's Diane's kind of companion because certainly Diana, Diana can't yeah. be living alone so she has this companion and she just sort of says whatever is on her mind out loud oftentimes interspersed with her dialogue with somebody so she's meeting Stephen kind of speaking to Stephen as he's arrived at the house also summing Stephen up in her mind but speaking it out loud you know a, a little bit about like Diana's mad cousin um, that we had visited yeah. in the last book. And and a little bit reminded me of Killick and some of his comments yeah. that I guess Jack's not supposed to hear, but anybody in the offing can hear. All these little grouchy asides. Right. But Diana is still so excited to see Stephen. She runs down the stairs. She trips over these little pots and things and falls right into Stephen's arms. And we're thinking, gosh, this is not bad. They have all these talking to catch up and it's such a delightful conversation. It includes one of what I feel are, are, are one of the most underrepresented lines in the canon and one which I should be, you know, most gratified to see in wider use today. You know, we always hear the bottle stands by uh -huh. you or a glass of wine with you. But uh -huh. I loved, as Stephen said to Diana, if you please do not let us neglect the pale ale at your elbow. Oh, our, uh, <laughs> Our our times pubbing in 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 your UK, it that's always been a fondness of mine. And of course, India Pale Ale IPA, which is a super hip drink now, it was invented as a drink that would survive being taken in a boat to India for the, for for soldiers in the uh, in the Indian Army to drink. So there you go, Pale Ale, authentic and a hipster touch. We like that. 
Brilliant. That's right. So this, we're almost in rom-com territory here. He's showed up and she trips over a few things and they have a glass and they're talking about old times and they're companionable and it's all going to be okay, I hope. But Stephen realizes this could be the moment. Stephen even, and, and we're, yeah, we're getting to that moment too, but Stephen even broaches the subject of deal with her. You know, tell me about that girl you were yeah. with. Oh, I wanted to ask you about her. And, um, you know, what can be done with her? Because Stephen does, you know, she wants to make sure she gets fed. He knows he's going to be sailing away from Bombay and, you know, that she's well taken care of. But he doesn't want to see her life, you know, ruined into the brothels, into the sweatshops, into even just yeah. in, you know, with with the nuns or something. He's like, you know, I want her to stay alive and, and full of life like she is. And interestingly, Diana's reaction to that is, well, I really have to know a lot more about her to know what the options are, like what is her cast? And, you know, yeah. Diana says, you'll never believe the difficulties that can cause when you're thinking of a place for a child. She may be an untouchable, probably is. And here we have Diana, probably very realistically thinking about this. And yeah. Stephen are, as Sir Joseph Blaine had said, you know, as we talked about last week, are romantic, also are egalitarian. Yeah. It, it's just a bit of a contrast here, which then kind of sets up, as you say, it, you know, this conversation takes a little bit of a turn here. And she has begun to talk about the problems that she has with her reputation and how to live in amongst this snide, rather gossipy, rather cliquey society that she finds herself in in Bombay. And although Diana professes not to care what anybody thinks, she does value her place in society and she likes the idea of being being seen to be fine. So she's having a hard time. And Stephen picks up on the fact that she's unhappy fundamentally. She's unhappy with where she is and she's unhappy with the life that she's leading. Yeah, Canning's gone and apparently they have big arguments yeah. and there's a lot of jealousy and she feels like she's spied upon yeah. and mistrusted. All, All of these which, perpetual scenes, yeah. Yeah, perpetual scenes, exactly. Almost leading to a break, she says at one point. And Stephen says, uh, I'm sorry, in, in a bit of a harsh and formal voice, that you should not be happy, yeah. but at least it does give me some slightly greater confidence, a perceptibly greater justification in making my proposal. Diana kind of looks at him and says, are you going to take me into keeping too, Stephen? She asked with a smile. No, he said, endeavoring to imitate her. He privately crossed his bosom and then speaking somewhat at random in his agitation, he went on, I, I've never made a woman an offer of marriage. I'm uh, ignorant of the accepted forms. I'm, I'm sorry for my ignorance, but I, I beg you will have the goodness, the very great goodness to marry me. And as she did not reply, he added, it would oblige me extremely, Diana. And so here we have <laughs> Stephen blundering all out, saying not, hey, you know, hang out with me instead of Kenny. He's offering to marry her. And you kind of wonder, yeah. wow. For this culmination of all that we've been through up until now, what what happens next? And he's it's great. He's seen his moment. We've all been willing him on to say, just ask the woman, just ask the woman. And he has found his moment. He's not the smoothest communicator. He's not the greatest, perhaps, at framing it and carrying all of the emotional weight that, that lies behind it. She's also, to be honest, a bit selfish and a bit tone deaf. Yes. So I think between she not really realizing the sincerity of his offer and he really not being able to express the sincerity of his offer. You know, his 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 one big emotional giveaway is him crossing himself before he, right. he makes the offer. And that's not really him saying, you know, I've got some performance anxiety here. And she she completely misjudges the tone of his offer and he's left really humiliated as she says, well, you know, I I'm, I'm hold you in high affection, but she's not going to say, oh, sweep me off my feet. She's to use the modern phrase, she's friend zoned him. <laughs> right, right, exactly. He's exactly. Firmly, firmly in the friend zone. And he, he really works hard to, to to dig a bit further and to correct that. He says, no, no, no. This is a deliberate, long meditated statement. My appearance doesn't serve me. And he goes on to give an, an account of his fortune and his property. And she sort of acknowledges the depths that he's digging here. She says, Stephen, darling, you honor me beyond what I can express. I often speak like a fool when I'm angry. I am deeply engaged to Canning and he's extremely good to me. What kind of a wife could I make for you? 
And then she kind of dumps a bit of salt in the wound to me there where, yeah. you know, she says, you really should have married Sophie. She would have been content with very little. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, oh. Gosh, out. <laughs> but to her credit, she goes on to say, and you would never have been ashamed of her. Yeah. And this is the emotional high point of all, maybe not Stephen's professional story, but all of Stephen's emotional story so far. We've taken three books to get here, and it's really tough to see him get this opportunity to propose to Diana and for her to basically let let this fall flat at his feet. And we get one little emotional signal from him at the outset, which is him crossing himself as a good Catholic before he takes this big chance. And we get the hint from her as to what his response is when she says, Stephen, are you unwell? Right. Like, yeah, yeah. he can't speak. Poor guy is left in this house alone with the woman he loves and she's put him in the friend zone and he's put all of his courage and his status as a man out on the line and got nothing for it. Yeah, it, it's really devastating in a way because we love Stephen yeah. and and we also want to say this is not the woman but I know it is the woman in your mind it is the woman and and now she's going to kind of nurse him a little bit because perhaps she doesn't understand why he's so devastated you know maybe it's the heat you should put on one of Canning's gowns I'm preparing a room for you to stay in yeah. um, and then lo and behold Canning walks in and Stephen now I think kicks back into high gear a little bit, his yeah. intelligent agent part coming alive again and going, oh my gosh, how long has he been out there? How much of this has he heard? Um, and Where are the exits? Yeah, yeah exactly. And he says that, un, you know, unlike Diana's friend who will tell you exactly what she thinks in this conversation, Canning plays it very close to the vest and seems to be just fine. But he doesn't ask about Jack, which is a little bit of a tip off. And he immediately launches into a story about, you know, it's sort of good to be home. But he was saddened that a friend of theirs had had a friend of you know, a friend of the friends had kind of wormed his way into the marriage and the marriage bed and how awful this was. Yeah. And he and Stephen are going back and, and forth about how, you know, when you have a really good relationship, nobody worms their way in. But it's yeah. a bit telling here. It is, and they're saying, but they're not saying. And they're hinting, but they're not hinting. Yeah, exactly. So Canning calls a troop of Sikh guards to escort Stephen back. He says, you can't cross the city at night. And I think this is a little bit of a power play by Canning to say, let, my, right. let me and my guys take care of you and you get the heck off my property and stay away from my woman. Right, right exactly. And, and what's been going on meanwhile, of course, is that Jack has finally woken up to the fact <laughs> that Canning and Diana are coming to Bombay. He had no idea. And he's really not realizing that the, the the cat is already out of the bag. He's trying to get the ship ready for the 17th so that he can get Stephen back aboard and protect Stephen from all this. But the, the harm to Stephen is already being done. And Stephen, he's going to go back to his lodgings, escorted by these Sikh guards, to be told that by Bond and the skipper's waiting for you and there's a devil to pay and he needs you on board right this second and he won't take no for an answer. And Stephen somehow manages to say, I'll come shortly to Bond and I have no idea how Bond reconciles the idea that he's going to have to go back and right. probably have the hide off his back from the skipper. And Stephen cleans up and thinks he'll go and talk with Dill. He's, he remembers I think he clutches the purse around his neck and he remembers that he had this idea of of buying Dill into his own keeping and then finding a place for her. Right. And this walk that Stephen makes back into town gets us to this. I I think we both think this is one of the, the saddest, the most poignant, the most moving parts of the whole the whole canon, really, as this relationship and this connection between Stephen and Dill that's been built up in just a couple of chapters is is dead finds a crowd of people gathered around a body and the body is dill and she's been mugged and murdered for the jewelry that Stephen bought for her and he i think i haven't got the quote here but it says he hit the ground with a grunt like there's nothing about the urbane or worldly or together or savvy Stephen that's ready for this and he sees that she's gone and he sees that the gift of bangles that he gave her just a couple of hours before had been her undoing and with all of the 
build up that O'Brien had given us with the the really touching display of connection between Stephen and Dill and with his very affecting and very sincere portrayal of the joy of childhood and the joy of this uncomplicated love is taken away from us and it's it's a really heartbreaking moment and I'm sure many people most people all people who've read HMS Surprise remember this as one of the moments that is really hard to get through as a as a reader well, it's certainly not the kind of reading you want to be doing during a pandemic when tissues are in short supply. It's really not. It's really not well said. And he does see that he still has an opportunity to take care of Dill in death, even though he failed to take care of her in a way um, in life, because there's no one of her cast around because the burial has to be paid for and carried out by someone of her cast and from within her cast. And Stephen says, I am of her caste. And there's this really touching moment where he he claims filial connection to her. Right. He says, I am of her caste. Friend, tell the woman I will buy the child and take it down and attend to the fire. And it's funny, I remember reading the book, I guess, before I had kids, and it was a very tragic and bittersweet thing. And I think the more time passes and the more times I circumnavigate these books and reread this part, the more touching it is. It's a really rich piece of writing. And it has a special connection, I think, for anybody who's a parent. Um, It also means something more when you've been around India, and I've been to India a few times and seen how life is lived and seen the spirituality and the kind of fatalistic and spiritual nature of society. And then, actually, the aftermath, Stephen looking after the funeral pyre, saying goodbye to Dill, knowing that that's the end of the story for her is still quite calm and quite redemptive. And I have this sense of Stephen wandering Bombay as the sun rises and that there's been a bit of catharsis for Stephen and that this, this terrible event is even at least a little cathartic for Stephen. And I think that's a bit more real and a bit more wholesome than the transformation in, you know, in the storm and in the sunshine on St. Paul's rock a, a few chapters ago in the book. Yeah. And, if I can go on, oh, definitely. The, I, I think earlier on, Stephen lacked perspective as they were sailing up the Indian Ocean and Stephen was mulling over his connection to Diana and her prospects for love and the prospects for a relationship. One of the mistakes that Stephen was making in his character and his connection to Diana was he, I think he really lacked perspective about what a relationship and a marriage might mean. And there were things happening in the story like the confession of Nichols, the lieutenant, and like all the allegories and the images that we see, like the image of the sea serpent, all these warnings to say, it's not a bed of roses being connected to someone. And we were being told that Stephen lacked perspective on a relationship and on his relationship with Diana. And I think that the story with Dill, in a way, has given Stephen perspective. Arguably, he still hasn't got perfect insight himself because he's still pursuing Diana but I think that this perspective is going to be vital and maybe even life-saving for Stephen. And I think Patrick O'Brien saying that we all need this kind of perspective on, on who we are and how our lives are transitory and how we're formed by these perennially formed and renewed and broken again relationships with other people. And again, I think there's maybe some view of O'Brien himself and his connection with his family there. Yeah, well, can you imagine a world in which Stephen and Jack had not befriended one another. And as, as you know, now I'm thinking ahead in the canon, but you know, how different their lives would be without being in each other's lives like they are. Yeah. As Canning has taken his leave and sending Stephen off with his pack of Sikhs, uh, Diana catches him again after Canning leaves and says, Stephen, you know, you've made me an offer and it's taken me a bit by surprise. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm putting words in her mouth here. Yeah. L- you surely have to dock again in Calcutta on your return from dropping the envoy. Let me give you my answer then. The, the, the idea of a possible relationship, a long-term relationship between Stephen and Diana hasn't gone away and she's got him on... It's not quite fair to say she's got him dangling on the end of a string, but I, th- I, I think a friend of Stephen's looking at the situation with no great liking for Diana would say, she's got you on the end of a string, mate. And I, I, I sure would. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is kind of cruel. Uh, and I think we're all glad as readers and as friends of Stephen in, you know, in, in our role as readers, we're glad that he's still got that shred of hope because hope's clearly driving him. But we're also thinking, come on, fella, you know, be so much better for Stephen if he wasn't perennially tortured by this hope and 
persistent letdown from Diana. For sure. So this ending of the story of Dill is is really sad, and we have to f- ask ourselves, what does that mean for Stephen next, and where can he next go in understanding himself and understanding his connections to other people? I went looking for connections in literature between the evolution of character and relationships with children who who are lost, who die. And and there is one at the end of The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. And I'll mention it partly to show off that we did some research, but <laughs> mainly to say, well, this could be a connection that O'Brien might have had in his head because there are some striking parallels with the end of The Brothers Karamazov and the death of a child, Ilyusha. Uh, and Ilyusha is a boy who has had a, a friendship of sorts with Alyusha, one of the, the Karamazov brothers who's a monk. And at the end, there's a funeral and I found a great essay. I'll put the uh, link to the essay out. It's a it's a WordPress blog. And the essay says that the death of the child is central to Dostoevsky and to the book. It seems natural for the book to end with the death of a child and with a speech that orders that the death of this child should not be forgotten, but rather be cherished as a sort of talisman against future wrongdoing. And that this child, Ilyusha, was on the border between childhood innocence and adulthood, and that the child's death is an inspiration for union and communion among the people left alive, rather than the splintering off and rejection that sometimes meets the death of other innocents. And maybe there's some of that tone here that O'Brien's hoping that there's a meaning in the future for the story of Stephen and the and the sad loss of Dill. Well, it certainly resonates with me in a really nice piece of research. I mean, I remember right before Stephen sends Dill off, you know, he was thinking to himself when he went to buy her bracelets, the bangles, about how he really doesn't want Dill to go with him to Diana's house, um, that he's, he's really tired of lies and, and subterfuge and deception. And he's then going to buy the bracelets because he knows that if Dill doesn't go with him, she doesn't get her three wishes. So he'll grant her three wishes. But uh, he's thinking about this idea of subterfuge and and lies. And he says, there's some, and Diana is one, I believe, who have a separate truth of their own. Ordinary people, Sophie and myself, for example, are nothing without the ordinary truth, nothing at all. They die without it, without innocence, and candor. Indeed, the very great majority kill themselves long before their time, live as children, grow pale as adolescents, show a flash of life in love, die in their 20s, and join the poor things that creep angry and restless about the earth. And then ominously, you know, it kind of ends, Dill is alive. (sighs) And here's Dill is alive, Dill is innocent. And and we hope, yeah. along with the reference from Dostoevsky, that, in fact, something good will come from this, this reflection on this innocence. Yeah. And for now, I think the, the good's got to be somewhere within Stephen and in his character. And the, the, as he returns to the ship, I think it's obvious, although the nature of the loss isn't clear to everybody, it's clear to Jack, at least, that Stephen's devastated. And he's writing home, Jack is writing home to Sophie saying, I was ready to give him a treble shot at broadside. I was ready to tell him what what's what because he'd ignored my direct order to board the ship immediately. He had committed all these breaches of naval discipline. And Jack says, when I saw him, my heart failed me. You would not credit how unhappy and ill he looked. He's as dark as a native with the sun, but yet he looked somehow pale. Grey is more the mark. I'm afraid she, Diana, must have been most bitterly unkind, for although we've been at sea for some days now, and although we're back on our regular course, his spirits don't recover. I could almost wish for some benign plague to break out in the ship to rouse him. Oh. Like, there's going to be some some new role for Stephen to play in life, and even if that means disease aboard ship, maybe that's what we need. Right. That's right. <sighs> So Steve is back aboard ship. The surprise moves on with her journey, taking Envoy Stanhope in the direction of Malaysia 
and who is there who could make things better who could make it all okay again i think it's got to be jack of course it's got to be jack and uh, you know jack is is searching for how can i get to steven and it, there's this really cute scene where Stephen happens to walk into the cabin. Jack's been thinking about marriage to Sophie. He's sort of smiling and, um, you know, Stephen is asking, what are you thinking about? What are you happy about? And and they get into this little conversation and Jack says, would you like to see, you know, ask Stephen if he'd like to see a relic of his youth and, and promises mm-hmm. Stephen that it will, you know, quote unquote, raise his heart. So, uh, you know, and you, you should, you should tell the beginning of this story because they're, their journey there is almost as good as the destination. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, it takes us via our favorite place as well, which is the Lubber's Hole. It also has a nice flashback to earlier chapters in this book because Stephen's been to the mizzen top, he's been to the main top, but he hasn't been to the foretop yet. Right. And Jack's going to take Stephen up the foretop. And on a day when the crew were all rest, is this a Sunday? I think it is a Sunday. It's Sunday, absolutely. And the crew were all so the crew were all resting and they're having their uh, their time off and. Jack says, I'm going to raise Stephen's spirits and I'm going to take him to the foretop. He takes him to the foretop first. And as well as the skipper going up the rigging on a Sunday, the skipper's going up the rigging on a Sunday and with Stephen in tow, he goes through the lubber's hole, not the badass <laughs> hanging over your back way around the footwork shrouds. He goes up the lubber's hole, taking by surprise a bunch of HMS surprises, finest Four top men, including Faster Doodle, and I, I love the description of of the of the noise that Jack hears. His seaman sense hears this noise, the noise of the clicking of the dice, the deadly illegal fifty strokes at the gangway dice. Right, and this is great. Jack, Jack, Jack gets the chance to redeem everybody here because he goes, "I'm taking my friend up to this great journey to the four top. He's never been there. I'm going to show him something that's really fun." And on the way, I encountered my my crew gambling. I'm not going to darn thing about this. Faster Doodle swipes the dice into his mouth and he's kind of standing there like, hur, hur, skipper. And, and Stephen, not realizing any of this, says, okay, how, how's it going there? Did, did the rhubarb answer? Is your Are your bowels behaving again? Show me your tongue. Right. <laughs> and then Jack covers covers for his crumb. No, 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 doctor. We don't need to know about that right now. We're not going to, no, don't ask him to show his tongue on a Sunday. And he's obviously going, you mate, don't let me see those dice and get yourself back down on deck. Uh, and, and by the way, the fact that the foremast cap exists and it has this relic suggests that it was just the four top mast and not the whole foremast that was lost in the storm. So I, I feel good about having spotted that. Well spotted. In- and the relic, <laughs> and, and the relic on the broad rim of the square hole that sat on the top mast head. So he's gone not to the four top, but to the head of the four top mast now. They've gone another stage higher with the initials J A cut deep and clear supported on either side by blousy forms that might have been manatees, although mermaids were more likely, mermaids drinking beer. And I love that Jack asks Stephen, does this not raise your heart? And to be honest, I don't think Stephen gets quite what it is and quite right. the, what the significance is, but he realises be, he's being encouraged by Jack to appreciate this. And I don't think he quite appreciates that this is a carving made by Jack in his youth, although Jack goes on to explain that. But Stephen, I think, is sincerely blown away by the uh, what you might call the Kate Winslet Leonardo DiCaprio Titanic moment of being high and forward in the ship and getting this glorious view. Oh, he says, I'm truly grateful to you, says Stephen, for you've brought me to this proud, perilous eminency, this quasi-apex, this apogee. You have indeed lifted my heart in the spirit and in the flesh, and I'm now resolved to mount up daily. Ah, oh, thank you, Jack. Well done. Yeah. That was the action of a friend. <laughs> it, it- it really was. And then you get this scene of uh, that I love that happens time and time again, where Jack is so tickled with himself for having given this this joke about raising Stephen's heart yeah. <laughs> that, you know, he can't help himself. You know, it raises it 100 feet above the deck. You know, I've pulled this off on you and everything. And Jack just can't help himself. And he's laughing and his face is red. And Stephen, who has not smiled since coming on board from Dill's death, uh, you know, yeah. said Stephen felt his mouth widen involuntarily, his diaphragm contract, and his breath beginning <laughs> to come in short, thick pants, right? Uh, it's yeah. awesome. And uh, yeah, I love that. I love that to see Jack laughing at his own mirth, <laughs> as Dylan used to say, no one more amused by their own small bits of mirth. 
No, and it's something we're going to come back to over and over again. Uh, another thing that we're going to come back to over and over again, I think, is one of O'Brien's things that he returns to is his description of, maybe as a way of telescoping time, he just describes the the the, the tone and the life of the ship when she's sailing across blue water, sailing in fair weather, sailing with an end in mind and sailing with with a composed and happy crew. And he describes the rhythm of the ship. He says, The grind of holy stones, the sound of swabs and water on the decks at first light, hammocks piped up, breakfast and its pleasant smells, the unvarying succession of the watchers, noon and the altitude of the sun, dinner, grog, roast beef of old England on the drums for the officers, quarters, the beating of retreat, the evening roar of guns, topsails reefed, the setting of the watch. This life, with its rigid pattern punctuated by the sharp, imperative sound of bells. I think it's a it's it's a token in O'Brien's writing of how he thinks that this is a this is a nice life. This soothing, repetitive, perhaps dull, but predictable and calm and stable life is one of the things that keeps the characters safe and feeling good about themselves. Ha, huh, there's really something to be said for that. And, and and maybe as we go through these perilous times ourselves here, there's a little bit to be said for adding a little structure and doing a little something and, and keeping yeah. things going. Yeah, a bit of structure and a bit of stillness. It's great. Yeah. They do relish it when the pace hots up, though, don't they? There's this chase and, uh, and, <laughs> and glorious, glorious sailing weather. And... <laughs> They cast the log, and Jack's quite excited because Surprise has been refitted. She's stiff and well-ballasted and weatherly and got a clean bottom, and that means she's making great time. The midshipmen and the lieutenants cast the log, and they come back to report that they're running 11 knots and 6 fathoms, which is pretty brisk. 11 knots is is, is fast for any sailing vessel. And, and Jack reports this to Stephen. We're running 11 knots 6, said Jack. Oh, says Stephen. I'm sorry to hear it. I'm most concerned. Is there no remedy? <laughs> no, and I, I I think we're allowed to guess whether that's Stephen joining in the banter and trying to undercut Jack and and and, and let a little bit of air out of Jack's personal balloon at going so fast, or whether he really doesn't know whether this excitement in Jack's voice is because they're doing great or they're all about to kind of crash into an iceberg. Right, right. It's too funny. And uh, maybe Stephen goes on. Maybe he's joining in the banter when he says, well, I speak under correction and with great diffidence, but I should have supposed that our progress was satisfactory, even though the vessel is notoriously weak and old, even decrepit. And this is a really obvious indication for Jack to fly to the defense of, uh, of the surprise. Yeah, O'Brien's done a nice job here. After this kind of devastating loss, we've got these moments of humor and emotional release and... Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's shortly after this, Jack has, they, they thought they had a chase. It turned out to be a Dutch ship. One of Jack's yeah. old colleagues from the Royal Navy, who's who's now captaining the ship. And one of the things he gives Jack is these feathers to take home to Sophie from a very exotic bird. And Jack shows them to Stephen. And <laughs> Stephen looks at Jack and says, have you ever contemplated upon sex, my dear? Never, said Jack. Sex has never entered my mind at any time. <laughs> of course, all of us have to say, whoa, full pause there, right? <laughs> Molly Hart. But carrying on, but Stephen corrects him. You know, he says, the burden of sex, I mean. This bird, for example, is very heavily burdened, almost weighed down. And all these extravagant plumes have but one function, to induce the hen to yield to his import opportunities and jack sort of you know it's like wow that's you know that that is a solemn thought and stephen talks about how he could take away all this and how the bird would be able to get around life so much more and then he looks at him and says he says jack were i to castrate all the surprises they would grow fat placid and unaggressive this ship would no longer be a man of war darting angrily hastily from place to place and we should circumnavigate the the terraqueous globe. <laughs> the, this is one of the things I love about O'Brien is I learn all these new words. And one day I'll learn how to say them, right? <laughs> With never a harsh word, there would be none of this disappointment in missing Lenoir. Uh, so I, I, this this idea of Stephen castrating everybody, we're back to this experimental ship. and Yeah, and like, like, like Jeremy said, humans as lab rats, yeah? Exactly, exactly. So... 
we said earlier on that Jack partly wished for some kind of illness to beset the ship so that Stephen could at least return to his profession and to healing as a way of feeling better about himself. And he's going to get it. He's going to get it. The, the, uh, while there's been some wrangling between the envoy secretary Atkins and this new uh, Malay aide, a person with the excellent name of Ahmed Smythe, envoy Stanhope himself becomes ill with something that O'Brien calls a calenture. Um, a calenture is a, apparently a feverish delirium formerly thought of as afflicting sailors in the tropics. So we don't really know what in modern day medical language a, a calenture would be, but there's something going on with the envoy that means he's sick and he's feverish and he's delirious. And although it does appear for a while that Stephen manages to get th- get him through the crisis, Governor Stanhope, or sorry, Envoy Stanhope, is still pretty sick. So they take him ashore at an anchorage found on the coast of um, Sumatra. And by the way, there was a neat bit of seamanship as they anchored in very, very deep water right out to the bitter end as they waited for the tide to turn. And then they towed the ship in, having left the cable and the best anchor buoyed. They slipped that cable and towed the ship in to a shallow anchorage close into shore so that Stephen could operate. And I don't think we ever learned exactly what the procedure was that Stephen was going to do. Pretty sure it wasn't going to be trepanning his brain, which is the other procedure that Stephen's famous for. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a suprapubic cystotomy, which is a a, a bladder operation that Stephen's famous for, for some medical procedure, surgical procedure that Stephen thought might help the governor that was his really only hope. Yeah, his only hope. And, and and we never get to find out because he never even gets to operate that the envoy who's been so sick and been treated for liver, been uh, horribly seasick and everything else, actually is awake all night from the sounds around him and finally just succumbs from exhaustion and dies. And it, it's odd, isn't it? I, I don't think any of us as readers felt very much for stand-up, although he was a sympathetic character, a little bit vain perhaps, and beset with all these troubles of the, the cantankerous staff who travelled with him. And on an important mission, compared to the loss of Dill, we don't feel very much, sadly. And he's certainly not mourned by the crew. I don't think he's mourned by Stephen and by Jack. And maybe this is the point where we get to come full circle and we come back to the quote that we started with at the beginning of the episode. So Patrick O'Brien writes, Jack looked out of the stern window at the distant receding land, dull purple now, with a rainstorm beating down on it. He said, we came on a fool's errand. And Stephen, as though in reply, gives this quote, All of a piece throughout, thy chase had a beast in view, thy wars brought nothing about. Thy lovers are all untrue. So this is my other bit of research, Mike. (laughs) This is taken from Dryden's uh, dramatic poem, The Secular Mask. And these lines, three of the lines in this poem, are actually addressed to individual characters in the play. So all of a piece throughout refers to the fact that these three characters all were equally fruitless in their endeavours. Thy chase had a beast in view is a line addressed to the goddess Diana, the goddess of um, hunting and of flirtation, if you like. Also, the goddess of chastity. Right. And also sometimes taken by critics to refer in this piece to, to royalty, to Queen Elizabeth I or King James I. So the, the chorus voice says to Diana, thy chase had a beast in view, meaning that there was something else going on behind the, the what you thought was a straightforward hunt. To Mars, the chorus says, thy wars brought nothing about, like you strained and fought and destroyed and slew, but it came to nothing. And to Venus, the goddess of love and eroticism, thy lovers were all untrue. So the relationships and the pleasure that you pursued were baseless. And what I really like about this is that, it is, well, first of all, we get a reference to Diana. <laughs> and The final two lines of the poem, O'Brien doesn't quote. The Dryden poem wasn't a tragedy, and this, although it sounds downbeat, this little collection of four lines is just part of the ending of the poem. The poem itself, the the play, if you like, was a satire on the passing of the 17th century. It was written for the millennium of 1700. The final two lines are optimistic. So I'm going to do the last four lines and then the final closing couplet that O'Brien doesn't use. All of a piece throughout, 
thy chase had a beast in view, thy wars brought nothing about, thy lovers were all untrue. Tis well an old age is out, and time to begin with a new. Mm. So I found that and I smiled. Time to begin with something new. And I think the whole tone of Dryden in general, and this piece in particular, is classic Enlightenment Stephen. I think he's saying chastity is overrated, wars are pointless, love is a distraction, and the only right pursuit for mankind to go, go back to our behavioral laboratory experiment the only right pursuit for mankind is the observation of events and of people and illuminated by reason and reflection so i think we've got hooray for jack for redeeming everybody and bringing stephen back to a to a happy place and raising his heart and hooray for dryden and the enlightenment saying you know what we can get through all of this with reason and reflection and now we wonder Will we get through all of this with reason and reflection? You know, our our mission is done. Where do we head? Yeah. Well, we head for home. You know, Jack's been having this thought of cabins with cabbages and veggies and Sophie, and he wants to head that way quickly. Stephen's probably thinking, yep, head for home, but we've got to stop in Calcutta first. Yeah. You see Diana? What's her response to his proposal? And when we first opened HMS Prize, we promised our readers it was a bit shorter. There was a bit more action. We got to the action quicker. But what of action now? And what will happen on their journey back to Calcutta and back home? Will this surprise pay off here? What's in store for the rest of HMS Surprise? So I ask you, Ian, what do you say to a bit more Patrick O'Brien next time? Mike? with all my heart. It is a multiple Kleenex job, but it's good. I cried like a baby this morning when I read over some of it again.